Keith, your, your story reminds me of Leo Szilard, who uh, said, I'm going to try, try to write down what the facts are. And the people said, well, does, doesn't God know what the facts are? He said, I don't know about that, but it's not my version of the facts. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I'm going to give my version of the facts as he started to, started to, to describe it. Carl Eckhart, Leonard Lieberman, and I had lunch at the Valencia one, one fine spring day in 1958. We, we began to talk about how we were going to, to recruit faculty members for our new campus. Leonard said there was a young physicist visiting here from the University of Pennsylvania as part of, of the Lady Hawkins group that was, that was designing a new f f fission reactor. His name was Keith Bruckner. We agreed to talk to him at another another La Valencia lunch. We had that lunch. Apparently, at the mean, in the meantime, Keith and Carl, had, or Larry and Carl, had, had uh, gotten some advanced information by going to one of Larry's, one of Keith's lectures. <clears throat> we had that lunch, and by the end of it, we had a new cha a chairman for our new physics department. Anyone who knows Keith would realize that starting a new, a new physics department in a non-existent university in a remote resort town where he would be surrounded by oceanographers was just the kind of far-off gamble that he would be completely unable to resist. The task would not be not as physically demanding as rock climbing, but in every other way it would be much more difficult. We had talked with Keith about our ideas of building from the, ground, from the roof down with a group of full professors <clears throat> who would bring most of their graduate students with them. <clears throat> For the first few years, we would have only graduate students until we had built up a sufficiently large faculty to handle any graduates. <clears throat> Keith immediately started to think about what the new physics department should be like. Obviously, it should be a great physics department, preferably the best in the country. In the, at least in the areas it covered. He never even thought twice about that. But what kind of things? Should we cover the waterfront or should we concentrate on certain fields? We had no laboratory, no expensive equipment, and little prospect of getting either for some time. There were several physicists on the staff of the Scripps Institution, but they had worked for years in the physics of seawater and the oceans, and these areas were very far from the heart of physics. <clears throat> He suggested that instead we should try to recruit a group of specialists, that, that we should try to recruit, recruit a, group, a group of specialists in solid state physics and related fields, and also in plasma physics. These would be mainly theoretical physicists, again because of the difficulty of obtaining enough expensive experimental equipment. As might have been expected from those who knew him, he started out with a rush and he kept on running. He never stopped. He knew a lot of physicists, and he was quite brash about asking them to come to La Jolla. Sometimes he and I both worked on a prospect. Keith would make the initial approach and ask our candidate to come to visit La Jolla, where Ellen and I, or Leonard and Shirley Lieberman, would give a dinner party for him and shower him with affection and eloquence. Then in the morning, I would get him into my office, which is, by the way, right on the beach then, and was right on the beach then it is now. And I, diag and I would diagram on the, bl on the blackboard how we were going to build our new university. We had several ideas. <clears throat> One of them was to build a series of small liberal arts colleges or little universities, somewhat like Princeton, side little universities side by side. These colleges were thought of as having about 2,000 students and about 200 faculty members. Not at all the same as, as the the uh, Oxford or Cambridge colleges of about 200 students and a group of fellows, <clears throat> but 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 uh, but more but more like uh, little universities. We thought that the faculty of each college would be would be small enough to know each other and to have confidence in each other, so that, so that they might be willing to innovate and to try out ed educational experiments together. This was a great contrast to our our, our experience at Berkeley, where where there was just one faculty consisting of th literally hundreds, of, uh, literally thousands of, of, 
of individuals who didn't know each other really had very little very little confidence in each other. Another of our ideas was to have the arts departments consist of small real artists rather than art historians or, or critics. In this way, they would be more like science departments. So our theater department today, for example, consists of actors, directors, and stage designers. Our music department consists of composers and performers. And our visual arts department also is made up of creative artists rather than art historians or critics. We had essentially no library except in oceanography and earth sciences. Until, until we could build a library, we thought it was necessary to concentrate on the natural sciences. Since the social sciences and humanities depend for their effectiveness on large libraries. So we started with three graduate departments, <coughs> physics, chemistry, and biology, under Keith Bruckner, Jim Arnold, who was here tonight, and David Bonner, who was then at Yale and now passed away. In physics, the Bell Labs were the major center of solid-state physics at that time, and Keith proceeded to pluck off some of their stars. We reached particularly for Brent, Mer for Brent Matias, George Fair, and Harry Sewell. Keith was not shy about asking about three other universities and laboratories either, where he found Margaret and Jeffrey Burbage, Norman Cole, Walter Crone, Oresti Piccioni, Marshall Rosenbluth, Sheldon Schultz, Bill Frazier, and David Wong. Some of this came easily. No, no, I'm sorry, none of this came easily. I remember one night driving across the wastelands of New Jersey, starting in New York, to Brant Matthias, to Matthias' home in one of the small towns near the Bell Labs. Brent was his usual gracious, almost old-worldly self, but he was clearly skeptical about, where he, about, about, about what we had in mind. I spent several hours talking to him and his wife, Joan. By the end of the evening, as I remember it, he had agreed to join us, but memory in such cases is notoriously deceptive. I also made two overnight tri tri visits to Keith's house outside Philadelphia, where we were able to discuss our hopes and plans. The new campus had been an army training camp during World War II. Its highest point was an old beach ridge on the Linda Vista Marine Terrace, where the School of International Relations and Pacific Studies now stands. At this point, there was an old fall. At this point, on the top of the ridge, there was an old fallen brick chimney. I used to take our prospective professors up to this point, climb up on the old chimney, and look around, saying something like this: "Can't you see a great campus rising all around here?" <laughs> some people could see the new campus, and some couldn't. <laughs> the ones who couldn't stayed with their old university join our faculty. One of them was the great astrophysicist, Chandra C. Carr. Despite his ability to see distant stars, distant stars and galaxies, he didn't seem to be able to visualize a new campus. And he stayed in Chicago. In fact, a good many people turned us down. I remember Edward Freeman, who's now become director of the Scripture School of Chicago. Rudolf Bosbauer, Francis Frank Lowe, Lowe Murray Gelman, no, no. Donald Glazer, Murph Goldberger, Edward Saltpeter, and Valentine Delegte. One week, I, one week, I one weekend, I traveled in the middle of winter to, to Iowa City, trying to seduce Jimmy Van Allen. It was a marvelous little picture, best little picture postcard of a town, covered in white, crystal-like snow. And I soon realized that I would never woo Jimmy away from it. I visited David Pines and his wife and his wife Susie in Illinois, and they didn't join us either. Again, they're here tonight, however, easier tonight. Mar Maria Miller fell into our laughs when her husband Joe decided to join Jim Arnold's new chemistry department. In spite of her brilliance and distinction, she had never been given a faculty position in, La Jolla, in Chicago. Moreover, Chicago was an easy place for which to recruit people, a kind of a, a, kind of a patsy of a university, because the neighborhood had greatly deteriorated, and it was unsafe for faculty members to talk to walk outside their houses at night. I had first learned this the year before when I spent an evening with Harold and Frida Uri, and found that they were quite willing to leave Chicago and come to the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. 
You, might, you may quite properly ask how we managed to, to make these faculty appointments without the usual torturous procedure of ad hoc committees, the Committee on Academic Personnel, and the panoply of deans and vice chancellors that nowadays have to approve every appointment before it goes to the chancellor. I don't quite remember how we did this, but I believe we simply appointed committees consisting of Scripps Institution faculty members to review the proposed appointments. Members of the UCLA faculty also helped with these committees. But their reviews of candidates' qualifications had to depend very largely on Keith Brooker's judgment. Fortunately, that judgment was superb. Except for Harold Urey and Joe, and, Joe and, and Maria Mayer, none of the other physicists or chemists we enlisted were members of the National Academy of Sciences. But there were a dozen of them, but more than a dozen of them became members through the next 10 years. These included Keith himself, Margaret Burbage, George Fair, Walter Cohn, Norman Crowell, Brent Matias, Marshall Rosenbluth, and Harry Sewell. And in chemistry, Jim Arnold, Bruno Zim, Martin Kamen, Sammy Miller, and Hans Seuss. You will notice that all of these above named were appointed as professors. It had, it had been expected, of course, that as a new, small, and new as, as a small, new, small, and poor campus, we would start mostly with assistant professors. We did have a couple. Bill Fraser, now vice senior vice president of the University of California, is one of them. Was one of them, and Sheldon Sheldon and Schultz was another. I know, I noticed that this grand tradition that mostly professors has continued in the physics department, which at present has 48 full professors, five associate professors, and six assistant professors. <laughs> Keith was always interested in money for himself and all other physicists. <laughs> he was determined to get the fattest possible salaries for all his recruits. Of course, I intended to resist this project because every appointment had to be approved by Clark Kerr, who was sensitive to criticism if we got too far out of line with other UC campuses. The legend grew that we were paying overscale salaries for our new appointees. In fact, I had a self-made rule that we, they would not pay a new faculty member a salary higher than that, than, that which, than that which she was already receiving. My theory was that if you could buy a professor with money, somebody else would be able to buy him away from us. We wanted people who would fall in love with La Jolla and would and wish to stay here. But although I didn't realize it at the time, for our recruits from the Bell Labs, my self-made rule amounted to at least a 50% raise in salary. They had 12 months appointments at, at the laboratory, and in La Jolla they needed to work for only nine months, with three months in the summertime for consulting or other income enhancement. After the physics department was well started, Keith went on to become graduate dean for the new campus. And he continues to exercise his good taste and natural talents as a faculty recruiter for other new departments of the university. For example, Bill McGill, who used to be chancellor here and was later chancellor at Columbia, told me the other day that both he and, and the, and the Mandlers, who were the backbones of our psychology department, were recruited by Keith to start the new CSD Department of Psychology. And he was also very much involved in building up the departments of history, literature, linguistics, philosophy and mathematics. One of the problems with our new group of high-powered professors was, was, was that we had no place to put them. For two or three years, they had to content themselves with laboratories and offices in, in Sveriges Hall and other, nooks and, can and other nooks and crannies of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. This was not as bad as it sounds, because they were very close to the ocean and in the middle of Scripps' cozy setting. In fact, Baron Matias was quite reluctant to leave with Fairdip Hall for the new buildings on the hill. But by the time all this was happening, I had left La Jolla to go to Harvard, and I knew of subsequent events mainly by hearsay. During these 30 years since this, those days, UCSD has, grow, has outgrown both Keith and me. From its small, chancy, exciting beginnings, it has become a big, important, rather fr fragmented place a place we are all proud of, but, it, it's, but a place which is rather difficult to love. But it is clear to all of those, all of those who knew the story of those early days, that Scripps would be a far, that UCSD would be a far different place if Keith Brooker had not thrown his enormous energy, his brilliant mind, and his strong character into the building of this new university. We all owe him a great deal, 